Record. Hi, welcome to uh, our webinar series on uh, developing principled Christian leaders, sponsored by the Congregational Vitality Team for the East Ohio Conference. Uh, today's topic uh, is leadership covenants, and there's a handout for this session. It would be helpful for you to have that as we go through the course. Uh, my name is Ken Willard, and I'm with the organization Leadership for Transformation, and I'll be your host today as we go through the webinar, and I'd like to begin with prayer. Uh, Father God, thank you for uh, tonight, for our conversation, uh, for the gift of technology, uh, and just for uh, the ways that you, uh, the way this, ways that you lead us uh, in your path on your journey. And Lord, I just celebrate, uh, I celebrate your covenant with us for us to be your people. So may your spirit just guide our conversation and, uh, and just help us to live lives uh, just full of your glory. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so tonight we're talking about leadership covenant. And the Bible uh, references covenants quite often. In many cases, the word covenant is not used directly, uh, but it's alluded to with words such as promise or word. Uh, here's a short definition of the word covenant. To agree, to be of one mind, to come together. And I especially like the uh, to be of one mind. Uh, when I think about leadership at all levels of the church. Uh, so uh, if I can, Kelly, if you'll read the, uh, the remaining part of the definition on the screen for us. A binding and solemn agreement to do or keep from doing something. Is and that the it? Rest, yeah, go ahead and do the rest of it. Uh, from Psalm eighty nine thirty four. No, I'm sorry. Uh, an agreement instrumental for covenant living in the context of accountability. Oh, okay. I could that's not okay. see. It's behind our pictures. Okay, that's all right. So, <laughs> it's behind our video. So when you think about a uh, a covenant as it relates to accountability, what role might a covenant play in accountability? Oops. Brian, I think you were talking, but for some reason it was muted. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think that that covenant keeps people of one mind in whatever organization you're in. Right. Good. Good. Excellent. Yeah, the, the covenant is really what we're accountable in some cases to. You know, we're accountable to the things that we're, we're in covenant with. Uh, so, you know, before I go on, let me just ask, uh, ask everybody, you know, what actions or behaviors have you experienced in a leadership meeting uh, you wish had not happened? I think sometimes we, in, in leadership meetings, sometimes we get into personal things about other people that maybe should not be in that particular meeting. And um, I, I think that's, that's one of the things of having a covenant, too, is to be responsible to each other and to keep some confidentiality, maybe in whatever group we're in. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, what about the other side of that coin? Uh, what actions or behaviors do you wish had occurred more in leadership meetings? People coming to a mutual consensus about what the next step is and um, mm. allow, allotting the resources needed to get there. Good, good. So, so people are agreeing, you know, what's the next step? How are we going to get there? Uh, and how do we you know, utilize resources to enable us to achieve that? Good, good. I think those are, you know, two questions to think about, to consider uh, as we, you know, as we look at what, 
you know, what role do leadership covenants or should leadership covenants play in the local church? So uh, there is a great, uh, there's lots of quotes, actually. There's lots of different scripture references to covenants. Uh, this is just one of my favorites uh, from Psalm 89, 34. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Um, you know, I just think that's a great reminder for us uh, to, uh, to keep that in front of us. Talk about covenants, making covenants with each other, and, of course, you know, covenants with God. So on the screen and in your handout uh, is a quote from the book, The People Principle. And uh, Brian, if I could get you to, uh, to read that for us. Sure. People soon discover the level of performance that their managers will settle for and gravitate to that level. Managers then assume that's all that people are capable of achieving, so they accept it as fact and quit challenging their people to get better. So each reinforces what the other believes. Thank you. So the author is clearly speaking about the business world, talking about managers and, and employees, not necessarily the church world. You know, what correlation do you think this might have to our discussion today? Well, we've talked about before how when whatever level somebody joins the church at is the level they stay at. Right. In terms of membership activity level. Right. Right. Yeah. Good. And good. so I, yeah. Good. Anything else? I, I think so many times in the church, we don't set the bar high enough um, for the members of the church. Um, especially when it comes to membership and, and having a covenant that says you need to come up to this level to be either a member of the church or to come up to this level to have a certain type of discipleship within the church. And um, sometimes we fail as, as managers, so to speak, to set those bars for people. Good, good. Yeah, yeah, I agree with all that. And I just think that uh, in, in many cases, it's more miscommunication mm -hmm. or, or maybe miss, um, you know, not, not setting the expectations, not, not uh, clarifying the expectations mm -hmm. and just assuming, well, you know, that's, that's all people are ever going to give. That's all people mm -hmm. are ever going to serve. That's, you know, what, whatever it might be, we make those excuses. Uh, and I think that we just have to be so careful about that. You know, in, the, in my consulting work with churches, I've heard people complain uh, that many people in their congregation only attend church a few times a year. And uh, at some point I'll ask, well, you know, what's your expectation for church attendance? Mm -hmm. And in most cases, the pastor or somebody will say, you know, well, my expectation is they're here every week. And, and then I usually ask, well, have you ever communicated that expectation to the congregation? Mm -hmm. And it usually gets very quiet. <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, right. and, and I, you know, I don't think it's bad. I don't think people are bad. I just think that sometimes we're just falling into the trap of assuming and we're making excuses and we're just not, you know, we're not communicating clearly. Uh, I really believe most people want to do what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. uh, our role is to clearly communicate those expectations. So let's, let's talk a little bit about covenants. So, you know, where have you used covenants before in your church? If you've ever used them, have you ever used covenants at all anywhere? Well, there's certain Bible studies that we've used covenants in because sometimes during those Bible studies, things come out from people or about their families that really shouldn't be shared, you know, with other members of the church, maybe. So we keep a covenant to, to like, what, what's in this Bible study stays in this Bible study with each other. Good, good. That's a great example. Um, so does, like, when we do a wedding count? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. But I, I think of also all the covenants in the liturgy that we have, baptism, membership, 
uh, leadership covenant that's inherent in some of our liturgy if we use that. Right. Um, and uh, then some small groups, you know, if we've done Wesleyan covenant groups, those kind of things. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. You guys hit on, you know, really a lot of different um, areas where I think covenants can be very helpful. And uh, I think those are great examples, membership, leadership, Sunday school classes, small groups. Uh, you know, I think there's a, a, a place for covenants in many different uh, areas within the local church. So next question is, you know, what actions or behaviors do you feel are critical for the leaders of your church? What are your expectations for leaders? Well, I'd expect them to model the behaviors that they want mm -hmm. from other people that they're leading. Okay, good, good. Anything specific come to mind? Well, I, I, I'm just... <laughs> I'm just thinking of even promptness at meetings. You know, right. I, I, I think Methodists are notorious for being late to meetings and things. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I, I expect my leaders to start meetings on time and, and to be them, themselves and have things prepared and be ready for whatever meeting they're going to have. Good, good. Excellent. Yeah, and I think the modeling also goes with modeling what it is to be a disciple. Mm. Uh, you know, how are you in your worship? So I would expect leaders to have a, a consistent worship attendance, um, have a consistent giving pattern, um, prayer life, those kind of things um, I think are all important for leaders. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think, you know, all of that, you know, we, we need to expect from our leaders at least what we're expecting from everyone else, especially as a disciple. Uh, mm -hmm. And and then the bar gets raised as a leader, as a model. And what does that look like to model that way for others? So yeah, I think you guys are talking you know, right uh, right in line here. Prayer, serving. You know, do you expect the leaders to serve? Do you expect the leaders to give? Um, you know, I unfortunately I've you know I've encountered churches where you've got leaders who who aren't even giving to the ministry. You've got leaders who aren't serving anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's just some dangerous things. What are our expectations? I think it's good for us to ask those questions and, and to be clear on that. Uh, and then, you know, the, the follow-up question is always, well, how have you communicated those expectations to them? Um, and I think that, you know, just, again, we, we've got to be careful assuming. Uh, we've got to be careful um, just feeling like, well, this person has been in the church or they've been in leadership positions before, uh, things like that. I think we, you know, we owe it to them and we owe it to the ministry to ensure that we are communicating those expectations clearly. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share some, uh, some best practices that I've picked up over the years, uh, regarding leadership covenants. Um, you know, these are just, uh, a few, there's, there's lots more, and there's probably lots more that I've never uh, picked up. So I'm just going to share a few here that I hope are, are helpful when you think about uh, establishing leadership covenants in your church. Uh, the first is no surprises. Um, you know, I think all organizations, all churches, you know, have unwritten rules of behavior. And in some cases, those rules have become so deep that they're just part of the culture. Mm -hmm. And those don't change easily, uh, but they can be changed. And I think we need to be intentional. We need to communicate clearly. Um, you know, here's, here's an example, Brian, kind of going with what you were saying earlier, I think. But, uh, you know, let's just say that at the church, you know, every leadership meeting, ad board, whatever you want to call it, uh, for years, has always started with a few minutes of fellowship. Mm -hmm. So even though the agenda says you start at 7, uh, you know, most people don't show up until a little after uh, because the meeting never really gets started until about 7.15. Uh, 
So, you know, we got to be careful that we don't walk in one day and just change it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we want to start at seven. So suddenly, you know, we start at seven and now leaders show up a little bit later, you know, seven ten, and they're walking into a meeting already in progress. Um, that's not good for anyone. Uh, so again, just an example, but we need to think about that no surprises culture. How do we, how do we communicate without, you know, surprising people? Um, the second one is give them input. Mm. So rather than just walking in, let's, you know, let's say you're the pastor and you've got, you know, the perfect leadership covenant. <laughs> you know, you've researched, you've pulled it together, and you've got everything on the covenant exactly like what you want, and you're ready just to walk in and say, sign it. Um, I would always say, you know, pause. <laughs> Take mm -hmm. a deep breath, put that covenant in your pocket, and at least give the group a chance to feel like they're part of creating it. Yeah. yeah. You know, ask them, you know, what type of code of conduct should we have for how we operate as leaders in the church? Uh, you know, what actions or behaviors should be listed? Uh, ask them, how should we behave as leaders in the church? Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, chances are very good that they're going to come up with just about everything on your list. Now, it may be in little different words, different language, things like that. Uh, but in my experience, they're going to come up with 70, 80, maybe 90% of everything you have. And then you can just fill in the gaps. Uh, if there's something really mission critical that you feel is missing, then that's your chance as the pastor or as the ad board chair or whatever your role might be to add that. But at least the group has come up with the majority of it themselves, mm -hmm. and they own it. You know, it's going to be very different them coming up with it than you just walking in and presenting it. So the third best practice uh, that I would share is connect it to Scripture. Uh, in my experience, it's very easy to go through and connect each item on your uh, leadership covenant back to Scripture. And I just think there's a lot of power there. Um, you know, you might even assign one item on the leadership covenant to each leader and ask them to come back with scripture verses that they feel best relate to that item. Again, they might come up with a different verse than you had in mind, uh, but it's going to be very powerful for them when they are able to come up with it themselves. Uh, so I just think it's wonderful to, to have that leadership covenant but to have it very clearly connected uh, back to scripture. The, the fourth best practice that I would share is to mail them signed copies. Uh, I always encourage having each leader sign a copy of the covenant. There's just something special about signing your name that makes it real. <laughs> um, right. Think about, you know, anytime you've signed your name, uh, whether it's a you know tax form or <laughs> or whatever, uh, you know it really it, it really makes it real. Uh, so I would say ask them to sign their names and then you know make copies of it, uh, and then 30 days or so later, mail each leader a copy of their signed covenant, and and maybe include a short note about how excited you are to have them on the team, you know things like that. Personalize it. Uh, but you, you'll be surprised how much this can mean to some of your leaders. Uh, not just signing that covenant and it goes in a file, uh, but you or, you know, somebody that in the church taking the time to make copies and to mail it to them. I know leaders who have held on to signed covenants for years hmm. um, because it just meant so much to them. And then... Uh, the final one I would share best practice is uh, to renew it annually. You know, put it on the calendar. Uh, and, you know, maybe it's each time that you rotate a new group onto or off of a, a team or, or whatever works best for you. 
but I think it's good not to just do it one time and forget about it. Uh, I think it's great to, to have some type of renewal. Maybe you have a, a conversation. Do we need to adjust anything? Uh, do we need to make any changes? And then, you know, have each leader sign a new copy. Uh, make it a really big deal. Uh, now, I would encourage, we want to make sure that we keep it spiritual uh, and not punitive or, or routine. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that the, the church leaders really understand and see the spiritual side of this. So I hope those best practices, I know there's just a few of them. There's, uh, I'm sure there's lots more, but I hope those are helpful. I, I am always asked uh, when I share and talk about leadership covenants, I'm always asked to share a sample. Um, so in your handout is one that uh, I actually put together for my home church uh, last year. Uh, and I share it just as an example. Uh, it's always better to create one specific for your ministry and your leadership team. Uh, you can go online and you can Google leadership covenants in churches, and I'm sure you can find dozens of examples. Uh, I think it's good to see an example, but I, uh, but I would really strongly encourage you to create one yourself. Uh, so uh, hopefully you see that example and you had a chance to look at that. Any questions about that, uh, that sample or anything you, you like about it? Well, it looks like you've covered several different areas as far as their own growth um, and then also expectations for the actual church and then for their own service. Um, I like the way you have it grouped. Okay. And again, that was, you know, that's kind of based on where the ministry of that church was at the moment. Mm -hmm. And, and those were critical, mission critical type areas for us in leadership. And I'm sure yours and you know, every church is gonna be a little unique. Very cool. So you did this as a group then or? Yes. Yes, we actually, uh, this is, uh, oops, sorry. Um, the executive team and, and many of the, of the leaders got together and, and came up with pretty much everything on here. Okay. And to be honest, uh, we've used leadership covenants, membership covenants, you know, various covenants uh, for the entire existence of our church. We've been around mm -hmm. almost 20 years I know that's not long in the church world, but uh, we've been around about 20 years and we've done it from, from the very beginning. Hmm. Well, good. So uh, before we end our webinar, I just want to open it up for any questions. Uh, if you don't have a question, I'd love to hear a key learning, something that you're you know, taking away from our, our time today. Well, one of my questions is, how would you do this with a large, large group of people, as in the elders of a conference? Um, I know the previous bishop and even the current bishop and some other people within the conference have been talking about some type of covenant that the elders would have with each other. Um, how, how would you go about doing something that, like that? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I um, rather than if it, if the group is too large for it to be done kind of live, if you will, uh, then maybe there's some pre-work mm -hmm. that could be done. So if you, you know, for example, if you look at the, uh, the sample that I gave from Morningstar, mm -hmm. you know, there's on, on this one, there's four areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just, I'm just making this up, but you know, maybe the elders, uh, beforehand, maybe the pre-work is what are the areas? Okay. Uh, you know, rather than getting into the exact specifics, 
maybe we first start with, you know, what are the, what are the key areas? And, and you may have to give some samples. You know, here's, here's five, here's 10 different areas. You know, how would you rank these as important to us as, as elders in the conference? Um, so maybe narrowing it down that way. And then once you have, you know, four or five or whatever kind of rise to the top, uh, that might allow you to, to then get to the specifics. Okay. You know, would it, would it, you think it would be feasible or, or go over if, let's say you have a group of maybe 20 elders that could get together and at least start an outline of this? Oh, yeah. To, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, especially if you're able to communicate to the whole group that you've got a smaller team kind of taking this charge. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if they have questions, comments, you know, here's where to go. Uh, give them some kind of voice uh, so that you can, you know, again, to help them feel like they're at least playing a role. Okay. Maybe, maybe they're not on the, the, the team themselves, but they have a voice representing them on that team. So basically we could get a skeletal outline or something, send it out to all elders, get feedback that way, and then progress from there. I, I think that's a great way to do it. I think that, okay. you know, because you, you gotta be careful. Everybody's gonna have an opinion. Everybody's gonna want um, something a little bit different. So, you know, I think, it's, I think it's good to say, you know, we're gonna hear opinions and comments for a while, and then, you know, we're gonna prayerfully consider and we're going to make a decision. Right. Right. Thanks. Sure. Great question. Anything else? Any other key learnings? Well, I, I think one of the biggest things I saw with the best practices is, is having people sign copies. Um, I, I did a sermon series. There were six six uh, sermons in the series on how to be a member of the church. And then within the bulletin, there was a, a covenant that gets signed um, and, and turn in that they would follow those certain things. Mm. And so once we were done with the whole series, I waited a few weeks and then I sent back all of their covenants to them um, just as a reminder of what we had talked about during that time. So like, like you said, I think when you put your name to something, it does seem to have more importance to it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and you know, in my experience, it's very rare for a leadership team to actually have to pull these out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the beauties I think is in most cases, you know, if the leadership team signs the covenant and everybody's in agreement, then they tend to kind of police themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's not, the pastor, it's not the ad board chair, it's the, you know, in many cases, it's the group kind of saying, hey, you know, Ken, <laughs> you know, we, yeah. we said we were going to show up on time, what's going on, you know, uh, mm -hmm. where they tend to call each other out and, uh, and help hold each other accountable. It's very rare, in my experience, for somebody to actually have to pull it out and go, okay, let's, you know. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, there's good times to do that, to do that. Uh, you know, especially the, the ones about sharing confidential information. Uh, I think it's really helpful when you're going to, you know, talk about the pastor's salary. Uh, when you're go going to talk about, you know, something that's very sensitive in an ad board meeting or whatever, any kind of leadership meeting, when you're about to cover something really sensitive, then I think it's very appropriate just to remind everybody, hey, you know, before I even get into this, I just want to remind us, we signed this covenant, you know, share the, share the scripture, <laughs> you know, you know mm -hmm. um, but, you know, really help people remember, okay, I got to be careful that I don't even accidentally share this with somebody. Mm. Yeah. Oh, we're supposed to be getting a salary for this? Is that? <laughs> uh, I can put you in touch with somebody. Oh, okay. 
I, I have no control over that. <laughs> All right. Well, good. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I hope you found value in this webinar, and I just encourage you to continue the journey. Uh, this is uh, this is one of about a dozen webinars that we're doing on leadership topics. So I encourage you to, uh, to check them out online or uh, to sign up uh, for the next ones we might have coming up live. If you have any questions, please contact uh, myself or, uh, or Reverend Kelly Brown at the conference office. So thank you and good night. Good night, thanks.